you have your packet, <clears throat> we're coming from page 28. It's also here, right here on page 28. And we're going to lift up verse 10 as our sermonic text. Uh, verse, verse 10 as our sermonic text. If you have health, life, and strength in your body, please rise to your feet if, you're, if you are able. If you are able, please rise to your feet in honor of God's word. Luke is the physician, giving those an opportunity who can. Luke is the great physician. He's a physician. He served alongside Paul. He wrote the book of Acts. But Acts picks up at the end of Luke 24. And right here we're going to look at a, a small, slight incident that happened when you came into a town of Jericho. Thank you. If you have it, say amen. And it reads as follows. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. For the Son of Man is come to, to seek and to save that which was lost. Please be seated with, now and pray with me. Father, we just thank you for this day. We just thank you for the blessings in this day, for that cool sunshine. Lord, we've, we've had rain all this week, but now, Lord, you refreshed us with the, that wonderful, wonderful sunshine. And it's a cool, crisp morning, and I thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for the fact that we, you touched us with the finger of love and woke us up this morning. And you blessed us with that, Lord, and we're thankful for that now, Lord. But now, Lord, this is the time to preach your word. Lord, let us be focused upon your word, Lord. Let us learn from your word, Lord. Let us feast upon your word, Lord. The Father God, we pray now that if someone doesn't know who you are for salvation of their sins, for the redemption of their soul, that they could come today knowing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we pray that someone who hears it and needs salvation comes and gives their life to you, Lord. And we thank you in advance for that person who either hears it on the internet or in person. Father God, we just thank you right now for each and everything. Lord, build me up where I'm torn down. Strengthen me where I'm weak, Lord. Use me. Make me small so that the congregation can see you, Lord. Let them hear you, Lord, not me. Father God, we thank you right now for these and all things in Jesus' name. And church said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to preach from the first to the tenth verse, but I'm lifting up verse 10 as my sermonic text. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save. To seek and to save that which was lost. I like to speak from the thought this morning. You were worth saving. You were worth saving. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, oh my neighbor, do you know that you are priceless? Let me just begin with the following. In the book of Luke, in the 15th chapter, even though we're in the 19th chapter, the 15th chapter sets up the 19th chapter. Jesus tells three parables about three lost things. First, it was a shepherd looking for that lost sheep where he leaves the 99 and goes looking for the one. Then there's the second story of a widow looking for her lost coin where she thoroughly sweeps the house looking for that coin and she calls her friends and rejoices. The third is about a father looking for his lost, lost son who got caught up in the world and caught up in the things of this world, Mr. Vaughn. And in every case of each thing that was lost, it caused great rejoicing because these things were found. The things that were lost were recovered and found and restored. Raise your hand if anyone has ever experienced losing keys, losing wallet, or misplacing some money. I'm the number one one of that for losing mo the money. Ain't that right, Sister Stewart? Things we consider important and can't afford to lose because of the inconvenience of having to replace those things. Replacing things like driver's license, replacing things or canceling credit cards. When these things get lost, there is an inconvenience to your life. If your li driver's license is lost, you just can't hop in the car and drive to the store like you want to. No, no. You have to go down to the DMV and replace it, wait in line, make an appointment. Do all these things that put a hold on your life. So here in today's text, Brother Paul, here in today's text is the story of a man who lost himself in the world. He started chasing money. He started chasing things of greed and thinking very selfishly with his life. He allowed himself to become lost in the things of this world. And he began to hurt his neighbors rather than to help them. All 
folks who make a dollar. He would step on his friends, Mr. Nell, to achieve greatness, hurt others, not caring about the end results of who got hurt and how bad they might have felt. But let me tell somebody here today, when you meet Jesus, hello somebody, your whole life gets changed. This man, when he met Jesus, he realized he was worth saving. And this is exactly what we see in the text here in chapter 19. We see a man named Zacchaeus who is desperate and in need of salvation. Come closer with me now looking at God's word, verses 1 through 5. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho and began, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief amongst the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste. Come down, for today I must abide at thy house. This is where I'd like to give you three for the Trinity, for the glory of God. Ms. Jan, my first point, we see Zacchaeus' reputation, and we see him seeking to see the Savior, and he ends up being seen by the Savior. We see Zacchaeus' reputation, and we see him seeking to be to see the Savior, and he ends up being seen by the Savior. Look at Zacchaeus' reputation in verse 2. Zacchaeus, he was the chief or head tax collector. We see that he's rich, and because he's a tax collector, he's hated. He's considered to be a traitor because he worked for Rome as a tax collector. You see, he was a liar, and we will see that later on in verse 8. He confesses to taking things from people through false accusation. In other words, he lied on people. Miss Anita, look at him in verse 3. He was a short man. It says he was little of stature. Lastly, because he was short, people probably made fun of him. Miss Lorraine, they told jokes all about him. Probably most of his life, probably told jokes about how short he was, little guy, little Zacchaeus. But but the thing is this, because he extorted money from the people through taxes, he may have gotten it even with those people who made fun of him by raising up their taxes. I remember Sean when you made fun of me and called me names, so I'm going to raise up your taxes. Erica, you called me little guy, little Zacchaeus, and you made fun of me, and I'm raising the prices up on your taxes. That's what Zacchaeus might have done. The scripture doesn't say that, but let's be clear about one thing. We all know the nature of people. When people see an opportunity to get even with someone, people go out and try to do that. Amen? And because he was a tax collector, people just would tear down his reputation. Because, let's face it, he was a traitor. He would rip off his own people. Miss Rebecca, by, by giving evil for evil doesn't justify or make it right. What are people saying about you today behind your back destroying your reputation? Miss Deb, calling your names. Miss Deb, telling lies about you, posting it on social media. Miss Anita, posting pictures and comments about you on Facebook. Christians, we have our reputation destroyed day after day after day because we stand for the man who hung on that cross. Our belief, we get torn apart like dogs ripping apart or chews on a bone. That's what they do to Christians' reputation. As a matter of fact, like people used to friend you on Facebook, but when they find that you're a Christian, they unfriend you. The Bible says this in Matthew 5, 11. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kind of evil things against you falsely for my name's sake. Look at verses 3 and 4. Zacchaeus was seeking to see the Savior, but he couldn't because of the press, meaning the crowd was very thick. It was a very crowded moment. And you do know that when Jesus travels around, Jesus has a large group of people following him. Not just his dirty dozen, the disciples, but he has other people who want to follow either to report on him, to spy on him, or to just be curious to see what's going on around him. You know what we mean by the press. If you've ever been to a Bucks game, you try to get to the concession stand during halftime but you can't get the food because of the crowd. Or when you used to go to the local bar, and as you would go to the local bar, the ladies' night, you're trying to make it from the bar back to your seat without spilling your drink. Don't act like you saved all your life because, you know, sometimes you might have danced once or twice in the club. 
Well, the same thing is here for Zacchaeus. He's trying to see Jesus, but Zacchaeus couldn't see, Doug, because he was too short. He was vertically challenged. He was shocked at Baby Gap for all his clothes. Zacchaeus broke character because a Jewish man doesn't run and they wouldn't climb trees. Look at what he does in verse 4. He runs ahead of the crowd. He climbs up a tree. He is so desperate that he humbles himself because he's seeking to see Jesus. He's heard about Jesus' reputation, how he's healed the sick, how he's raised the dead, made the blind to see. But the one thing Zacchaeus needed was forgiveness of his sins. But what has God done for you lately? How he's paid your bills. That's your testimony. How he's woke you up this morning. That's your testimony. How he's allowed you and me to see another day. And how he forgave our sins when we confessed Jesus as our Savior. Brothers and kids knew that he had a lot of sins. But didn't know how to deal with them. So he throws away all of his cultural mores just to see Jesus. All because he knew his life was a hot mess and he knew the only one that could save him. Say his name with me. Jesus. You see, look at verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus in the tree. He was seen by the Savior. And when the Savior sees you and talks to you, hello somebody, your life is about to change. This is my favorite part of the story. He calls Zacchaeus by name. Mind you, he's never met Zacchaeus before today, yet he knows his name. Now, how is that possible, Crystal? I'm glad you asked that question. You see, let me explain. Jesus is the second person in the Godhead. He's, there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And because he's God, he's omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing, Erica. You see, he knew brothers and kids before he was born. Let me put some Bible to that. Psalm 139, 15 says, My frame was hidden from you when I was made in secret. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed in your book all the days of my life were fashioned for me even before there was one lived. God knew you. God knew me. God knew brothers and kids before he was ever born. Before we were ever born. But it gets better. Let me drop this in your spirit today. John 10 3 says the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And if you know Jesus as your Savior, he calls you by name, Miss Minerva. He calls you by name, Miss Anita. He calls you by name, Miss Lorraine. He calls you by name, Miss Yvonne. Jesus is the only one who knows your name because you have a relationship with him, brother Doug. And Jesus saw brothers and kids and wanted a relationship with him. That's why Jesus looked up and calls him by name. You see, Jesus saw Zacchaeus. He knew he was a broken man. He knew he was a corrupt man. He knew he was an evil man because he was stealing from his own people. How many people know here that Jesus saw you? Jesus saw me. He saw us, a broken man, a broken woman, in need of a Savior. Somebody help me preach this. He knew that Zacchaeus was ostracized. He knew that he was criticized. He knew Zacchaeus was marginalized in society's eyes. But that could be any one of us here today. You see, we all realize that we needed a Savior. That's why we came to Jesus, just as we are. Look at the last part of verse 5. I just love this about my Jesus. He invites himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Whether his house is cleaned up, whether the maid put things back, whether the floor has been vacuumed, or whether the carpet has been dusted, or the bathroom has been cleaned up. The question I have for you to do today, Cedar Grove, is this. If Jesus came by for a visit today, what would he find at your house? Is your heart clean like your fridge needs some cleaning maybe? Clean up um, some of those old things, that beer that's in the back, that wine bottle that's in the back. Or maybe there's some things in that cigarette ashtray that you may not want him to see. Jesus says in verse 5, make haste, hurry up, I'm coming over. I hope you got something good to eat. Now that's the NIV version of Stuart's NIV version of it. But look at Zacchaeus' response in verses 6 and 7. He made haste, Zacchaeus did. He came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, all they murmured, saying that he was gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. 
Hello, somebody. Which leads me to my second point. We see the reception. We see the reception. And Zacchaeus' reception of Jesus was joyful, but the theys in the crowd were resentful. Hello, somebody. We see the reception. And Zacchaeus' reception of Jesus was joyful, but the theys in the crowd were resentful. Brothers and sisters, Zacchaeus knew he needed a change in his life. And he was smart enough to recognize that Jesus was that change agent. Look at the text, verse 6. He made haste. He came down and received him joyfully. Zacchaeus received Jesus obediently and immediately without delay. Meaning, he made haste. He scrambled down the tree, running home to get his house ready to receive the Savior. But look at Brother Zacchaeus' heart. He receives him joyfully. Now, let's be clear about one thing. Not everyone is thrilled about the fact that you become a Christian. Now, here's the thing. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who desire to live godly will suffer persecution in Christ Jesus, Ms. Minerva. So just as soon as you think everything is cool, everything is copacetic, people don't want to see you happy. They're not happy about the fact that you read your Bible more, that you don't hang out. They don't want you, that you don't smoke no more and you don't drink. You stop hanging out with them in all the wrong places and now you come to church. Now you come to Bible study instead. Let me be clear about one thing. Everybody's not happy about your blessings, your promotion on your job, the fact that you have a new job, the fact that you're going to college trying to better yourself. Everyone ain't happy about those things. People ain't happy about you having a new life in Christ. Why? Because as a Christian, we reflect the love of Jesus. So when people see Jesus in you, they see their sin. You're a conviction to them for all the things they do wrong. Let me be clear about it. The they's in the world want you to remain like this, paralyzed in your pathetic, pitiful situation. Hello, somebody. They rather have you messed up so they can talk about you. So they want you to stay right where they are. They want you to be just the way you are. They rather see you rejected by society. They rather see you neglected by society. They rather see you unaccepted and pushed off to the side. But let me be clear about one thing. When Jesus steps into your life, look at the change. Look at the change in verse 6. When Jesus steps in your life, there's joy. There's joy that the world can't give. The world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. Amen. Look at the text again Verse 7 And when they saw it They all murmured Saying that he was gone To be a guest with a man That is a sinner Anybody see the hating on brother Zacchaeus They're judging him And not celebrating the change For the good in his life Look at that last word Sinner at the end of verse 7, the they's are quick to point out, throw shade, talk about your past, about what you used to be, but not see how God has changed your life right now. Hello, somebody. You see, they see the splinter in your eye, but forget about that big old telephone pole stuck in their own eye. You see, the they's in the world liked it better when you were a drunk all the time, now you're sober. They liked it better when you were a party girl dancing all night long, getting high, out of control, living for the world. But now you come to church and you do your dance for Jesus. And when you were shouting, the roof is on fire, now you're on fire for the Lord, teaching and witnessing for the Lord. You see, let's be clear about it. The they's of the world want you to stay right where you are. But the devil is a liar. You see, haters are going to hate because they can't understand the new creature in Christ that you are. You see, the old things have passed away. And behold, all things become new. So I say, I'm a creature. You see, haters can't understand your joy. They can't understand your peace. They can't understand the change. And it doesn't come from the world. It comes from Christ. You see, the whole purpose, Jesus' whole purpose is in his name. There's nothing like the name of Jesus. It put joy in your heart. It makes me want to clap my hands. It makes me want to shout hallelujah. It makes me want to just praise him all day long. You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. Come on and give God some glory right now. Come on and give God some glory. But let's review. Thank you, Crystal. We see my first point. We see Zacchaeus' reputation. 
And we see him seeking to see the Savior. And he ends up being seen by the Savior. We see my second point. We see the reception. And Zacchaeus' reception of Jesus was joyful, but the they's in the crowd were resentful. Let me be clear about one thing. When I was in the Marine Corps, my, my, my platoon sergeant told me, we don't draw a chow or ammo for the they's. You see, there's only the Marines in your platoon that are on that roster that are in your squad that you feed and give ammo to. The they's in the crowd don't get fed and they don't get ammo. We get all the extra ammo and all the extra chow, amen? Lastly, in my third, we see my third point. We see the restoration. And the restoration brought about salvation for a son of Abraham and the salvation came from the son of God. Let's be clear about that. We see the rest restoration. It brought about salvation for the son of Abraham and salvation for the son of God. Looking at the text verses 8 through 10. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Look at Brother Zacchaeus. He was making a bold statement in verse 8. It was a reflection of the sincere change that Jesus had made in his heart. You see, Pat, now you can tell if someone's, how can you tell if someone's changed and if they have a sincere heart and they like to follow Jesus? Well, first, the change is visible, tangible, and public. You can visibly see it. You can actually touch it. And it's a public thing. Second, here's the main way. A person that follows through in their faith in Jesus, now their life and their lip is lining up with actions that show that they are living daily for Jesus. Let me repeat that again. Your life, meaning how you are living your lifestyle, and your lip, how you are speaking, how you are talking, how you are acting before the world. These actions show up that they are living daily for Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and ask him, how are you living? Look at verse 8. Zacchaeus demonstrates just those things. He visibly stands up publicly saying to Jesus, he's giving half of what he owns to the poor. That's the visible. Here's the tangible. He now restores all that he has stolen. Now watch this. Through lies and coercion. Meaning, all the things that he's taken from the people. He's lied on people. He's cheated people. And now he returns to it. Returns it to them. Not one, not two, but four times the amount he's taken from them. In other words, he restores them and then he blesses them. But here's the thing. Now his life and his lip is lining up with Jesus. Zacchaeus didn't have to talk about it. He started doing it. Hello, somebody. Let's be clear about it. The best part of this is the validation from Jesus. Jesus says, leading to his salvation as a son of Abraham. You see, Zacchaeus had betrayed his own people. He's been hurting and stealing from his own people. Someone's stealing from your family. I think that probably hurts the worst is when a family member steals from you. And that's what was happening. He is now restoring them and making him whole. And now Jesus is doing the same thing for him. Did I mention what Zacchaeus' name means in Hebrew? I forgot to mention that. You see, Zacchaeus' mom had big hopes and dreams for him, for her little fella. She named him Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus means pure and clean. And look what Jesus does for him in verse 8. He cleans him up and saves him and restores him and makes him the son of Abraham. Somebody should have shot him right there. He's putting him back in proper order between God and man, making him pure and clean, just like his name means. Verse 9, and Jesus says unto him, this day is salvation come to this house for so much as he is also a son of Abraham. I just love it. I just love it when my Savior validates a person, makes them whole again, Sean, makes them even better than what they were before. Jesus reveals his mission, his purpose. Look at verse 10, for the Son of Man is come to seek 
to save all that which was lost. You see, the term son of man was used by writers of the gospel to connect Jesus as a son of Abraham because he came down 40 and 2 generations. You see, since himself he has gone through the suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. Meaning, he knows how you feel when you're hurt. He knows it, how it feels when you cry. He knows what pain is. We have a Savior that knows what we feel. Don't miss this life application point. This life application point is this. Jesus, because he was the son of God, is able to restore a person, making them both spiritually whole, giving salvation by forgiving our sins. And because he's the son of the living God, he's the only one that can come to save the lost. But because he's the son of man, he knows what we go through. See, he only came for one purpose, because you and I were worth saving. Tell your neighbor, he's talking about you. You see, we all were lost at some point in time in our lives. Before we came to Christ, we were working for the devil. You see, any man that's not in Christ is working for the other side. But long as you confess Jesus, now you're working for his side, for the good side, for the Lord. You see, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He was looking for you. He was looking for me. Randy. You know what I like about search and rescue missions? They spare no expense to find the lost. They use every resource available. Planes, boats, bloodhounds, helicopters. They don't stop till they find what they're looking for. And that's what my God did for me. And that's what my God did for you. Because he thought that we were worth saving. You see, God spared no expense when his son, Jesus, shed his precious blood on the cross. God used all his resources. He sent his only begotten son. You see, he didn't stop searching until he found you, till he found me. That the whosoever that believe in Jesus could have eternal life. You see, Deb, we are real fickle pickles. Because if you read further on in verses 30, Five and 40 that same chapter Jesus was walked into Jerusalem and today is by the way um, Palm Sunday but he would walk in later on to the cries of Hosanna Hosanna but by Friday the same crowd that was praising him saying Jesus Jesus he's the man they'd be saying crucify him crucify him on that good Friday where he was hung from the 6th to ninth hour but look a little closer at the verse again 10 you see Look at the word. It is in the present tense. The word is is in the present tense, meaning not the past, not the not the not the not the right now, but the present tense, meaning not in the future, but right now. Jesus is still looking. Jesus is still searching. Jesus is here. And here's the best part. He's still saving. Hello, somebody. Jesus keeps saving. He's saving. He's saving. He said, presently, currently, right now, in this moment, right here today, somebody should have shouted on that because Jesus is still seeking. Jesus is still saving. Anybody want to be saved? Hey, hallelujah. I'm not making this up. Margie, look at the text. God is an original search and rescue team. He sent Jesus to seek and to save. And if I could use my sanctified imagination, he's sitting in a holy helicopter, sitting up high, looking down low with a spotlight, seeking who he can save, going low as he can, going everywhere. Jesus is an expert at seeking and save. You see, God lowered him to take the form of a man. God lowered him to die on the cross like a man. God lowered him so he could get sinners who are drowning in their sins. God lowered him that he could lift up, hello somebody, that he could be lifted up and draw all all men in salvation unto him. Look at that text again. It says, the son of man has come, is come to seek and to save. You see, Jesus died that we might live. He's the bomb that heals our bruises. You're never too low. Let me be clear about one thing. You are never too low to be lifted up by him. You're never too dirty to be cleaned by him. You're never too, be bro too broken to be fixed by him. You're never too damaged that you can't be redeemed by him. You're never too sinful that he can't save you. You're never too lost that he can't find you. And he's ne you're never empty. If you're ever feeling empty, he can't fill you. And you're not defective because if you are, he can restore you. Let me be clear about one thing. It doesn't matter if you've been left out, dropped out, some 
somebody may have put you out, you may have been drugged out, you may have been whacked out, somebody may have even stepped out on you. You might even be locked out. But even if you feel like you're a cop out, Christ will give you a bailout and he can break you out. Now you can stand out. So, if you don't realize it, you've been saved for a purpose. To God be the glory. You were worth saving. Anybody here today were worth saving? Anybody here today, if you rise to your feet to change your life for Christ?